Robin Harris, Executive Director of the Ivy League, and I went to law school and at Duke and where I had done my undergraduate work and while in law school decided to pursue a career in athletics. That was where my interests and passions lay. And as I explored professional and intercollegiate athletics by talking with various professionals in both um, sides of the equation, I, I became more and more fascinated and interested with intercollegiate athletics, the regulatory model, the um, principles behind uh, student athletes participating in athletics as one part of the overall educational experience, and I just became very interested in doing what I could to help further and promote intercollegiate athletics to provide opportunities for students to participate in athletics and, and develop the life lessons that they learn through participation in athletics as well as obviously um, the experiences that they get to have while they're in college. So I went and after law school, I worked for the NCAA for nine years. Half of that time, I worked with the Committee on Infractions as their staff member. And the other half of the time, I was in Division I governance, where I was the Associate Chief of Staff for Division I, responsible for all issues that affected Division I. I worked with the Board of Directors, which is composed of presidents. I worked with the Management Council, composed of athletic directors, faculty members, other athletic administrators, and uh, various other NCAA committees and um, issues. And that was a fabulous experience. I left the NCAA for personal reasons when I got married and worked at a law firm where I co-chaired the collegiate sports practice at Ice Miller, and I did that for six years, uh, working on governance issues, but also primarily working with uh, schools that had NCAA infractions and appearing before the Committee on Infractions in a different role than I had when I staffed the committee. And then the Ivy League came calling, and I uh, was fortunate enough to assume this role two years ago, and I'm where I should be uh, in terms of the values and principles that I hold in the, and focusing on the fact that athletics is one part of the overall educational experience. The Ivy League is composed of eight institutions, Brown, Columbia, Cornell, Dartmouth, Harvard, University of Pennsylvania, Princeton, and Yale. And I believe we are the most homogeneous league within Division One, and possibly within all of the NCA in terms of having eight private schools, uh, very good academic schools, obviously, but who also are competitive and want to sponsor strong athletic programs at the Division One level. We offer a broad-based sports sponsorship. Uh, we have the largest number of sports for any Division One conference. We have 33 Ivy sports, and that means that at least five schools have to sponsor a sport for it to be called an Ivy sport. Our schools average over 35 sports because there are some sports that maybe only three or four of them sponsor, so we don't call it an Ivy sport per se, but they're still sponsoring a Division One varsity sport. So to me, what that represents is that our schools really are about promoting fitness and athletic opportunities in a wide variety of sports. We don't just focus on a few sports that are the, quote, more popular um, sports, and we offer the widest range possible of intercollegiate varsity competition to our students because there are so many lessons that can be learned. Now, at the Ivy League, we have some basic principles which also uh, set us apart from our Division I colleagues. One, we do not offer athletic scholarships. Any financial aid that is provided to our students must be need-based financial aid. And then secondly, our student athletes need to be treated uh, like other students in the student body, and they are representative as a class, as close to as possible as a class generally, so that our athletes um, really are, are qualified to be at our schools, to do the work, to graduate, and become productive citizens. Well, football, it's interesting to ask about football because that is the really how the conference came to existence was because of football initially. When it formed, um, it 
was about football. The president's extended it to other sports many, many, many years ago. But um, our genesis is in football. And it wasn't that long ago that we were playing uh, with the what would currently be considered the football elites and were the football elites then. Uh, before the NCAA federated Division One. the Ivy League were among the top teams in football. And so we still have a lot of alumni that played on those teams and that care a lot about um, football. And then, of course, our the players who have played at the FCS level continue to care about football within the Ivy League, and, we, and we, we remain competitive. The University of Pennsylvania last year had a tremendous uh, football team, went undefeated, and um, won the Ivy title, and uh, really was among the best teams in, in the country. The president started looking at concussions and, and its impact in football about two years ago. There had been, in response to media stories, uh, where there had been a number of articles, particularly in the New York Times, but also elsewhere, uh, highlighting the potential long-term ramifications of concussions as well as sub-concussive head hits. And so we had several meetings, the presidents meet twice a year, and we have two medical doctors who are also presidents. So the president at Dartmouth, President Jim Kim, and the president at Cornell, President David Scorton, are both medical doctors. And all the presidents were concerned, but Presidents Kim and Scorton were able to really highlight the issues and to focus in on this is something we need to pay attention to. So we paid attention. Um, I developed research uh, summaries for the presidents. We were poised to take action about a year and a half ago, and then the NCAA took some action and beefed up its return to play guidelines and created the best practices document. So we felt that those actions at that time were sufficient, but we continued to monitor the research. And then last fall, there were some new research studies that came out. Um, some in response to having sensors placed in the helmets of three Division One programs, including two Ivy schools, actually. And it recorded that there were more head hits of magnitude in practices than in games, and, and that makes sense because you're running drills, it's repetition, but it was also concerning to uh, the presidents and to us. And so when the presidents met in December and we looked at the critical mass of information that we had, both in terms of various studies and in terms of the reports that were in the media, particularly the autopsies of brains from deceased former football players, it was just... Um, at the point where the president said, you know, we don't have all the answers. We don't know enough right now. We don't know how many hits does it take to have long-term damage. Who is susceptible to having this long-term damage? We don't have these answers, but we do know that it looks like there's a link. And we don't know what causes the link between the head hits and, long and potential long-term damage. We don't think it happens in everyone's case, but it's something we need to take action on. We need to protect our student-athletes, and we need to do it now. And so they were concerned about the long-term ramifications. I'm talking about what's called CTE, which is chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and, or CTE. And that can cause dementia and other behavioral issues down the road for players. And so we obviously want to avoid that. We also want to ensure that players are not playing before they're fully healed if they do have concussions and that they're immediately reporting symptoms of a concussion to their team physician, athletic trainer, or coach. And so the president decided last December to form a committee that would make recommendations to protect the welfare of our student athletes. And we formed this committee uh, with representation from every school. It was co-chaired by our two medical doctor presidents, Dr. Uh, presidents Kim and Scorton. And we included three head football coaches. We included medical professionals who were team physicians or athletic trainers. We had other athletic administrators. And then we also involved some expert consultants who have good familiarity and expertise in this area. And so this group met during the winter and uh, formulated a series of recommendations, which we released this past week. 
The recommendations focus on practices because, as I referenced earlier, uh, the research shows that there are more hints of magnitude that occur during practice than in games. And so we really wanted to reduce the amount of opportunities for head hits and practices. So we reduced the number of full contacts that are allowable in um, both in preseason, in the spring, as well as in the fall and during the season. And then we limited the contact that can occur during two-a-days in the summer. We also focused on education to make sure football players understand the consequences of concussion, short-term and long-term, the consequences of playing while injured. This is not like an ankle injury where you can tape it up and go back in and as long as it's not hurting too badly, you can play. A brain injury is is much more serious and can have long-term consequences. We also want to, um, through education, really continue to change the culture uh, among our football student athletes where it's not okay to play through a brain injury. And in fact, other teammates will say something to someone who they see as injured to say, hey, dude, you gotta get this checked out. It's not okay to be seeing birds flying around your head right now. Sure. Well, you know, it's interesting because uh, I think there, it, that the Ivy League is, from an outsider view, surprisingly competitive um, internally. And I, I remember very well when I was interviewing for this position, and there were a number of presidents in the room, and I talked about the fact that the Ivy League is such a homogeneous league, and we're so similar, and the schools are similar, and it, it's, a, it's a conference that works well together, and all of that is true. And I had a president look at me and said, yes, but when all is said and done, we still want to beat each other on the field. We're very competitive. And I thought that was a great statement because here we have these presidents who run schools where academics is clearly first, but they care about winning. Now, they care about it and keep it in perspective, which is the key. It's all about balance and it's all about perspective. So, yes, on a given day, absolutely um, one school wants to beat the other, and there is nothing like having a rivalry where the season is coming down to the wire. And, I mean, obviously, our season for two schools culminate in the Harvard-Yale football game or the Yale-Harvard football game, depending on which school you, you root for. And, you know, that is an amazing atmosphere. I've been to that game the, the past two years, once at Yale and once at Harvard, and you have 50,000 people tailgating and, and coming to an Ivy League football game. And, and it's it's a tremendous environment, very exciting games. Both years that I went, they were exciting. Certainly, I'm familiar with the history. Uh, there's a great documentary out there that if people haven't watched, they really should find it. It's uh, Harvard BTL 2929 from the late 60s. And it's just fabulous because Yale was the better team that year with NFL prospects. Um, and, and was up by a number of touchdowns, I think three or four touchdowns in the fourth quarter. And Harvard comes back to tie, and including going for the two-point at the end. And so it, it did feel like Harvard had won that game, even though it was a tie. And so those rivalries, you know, that rivalry in particular stands out. But we have other fabulous rivalries as well. Cornell and Columbia have instituted a, a I think, I forget what they call it, the cup for the state of New York, and they've instituted that with their games because obviously both schools being in New York, it means a lot when they play each other. And last year, I went to the Brown Harvard football game at Brown, and they, for the first time ever, had lights uh, in their stadium. They brought them in. They were temporary lights, privately funded, and it was an amazing atmosphere. The student body came out to support the Brown football team, and it was just an electrifying atmosphere. Uh, Dartmouth football has uh, really hit upon a resurgence, and their rivalries uh, depend upon the year. I went to the Dartmouth-Yale game last year, which was a very exciting game, won in the, in the last uh, few minutes of the game. And then, of course, you have the traditional Penn-Princeton rivalry where, uh, you know, people tend to think of Penn-Princeton basketball, but when you're with, a, if you're an alum of one of these schools, it's Penn-Princeton anything, and they just want to beat the other team. So it's a really exciting 
uh, league to be involved in, and the focus really is on the Ivy League competition, and and that's the purpose of it. That. Uh, our schools are focused on uh, competing against each other. Of course, we have non-conference competition, and that's all well and good, and we care about how we do against our out-of-conference opponents. But in the end, it's about winning the Ivy League title. Well, it's about following your passion and finding a place that matches your values. So for me, as I looked into professional sports and I talked to people in the industry that worked in teams, that worked in leagues, uh, I love professional sports. I went to the Yankee game last night, and it, it's fun to go, but it, it just didn't interest me, for me personally, as a career. As I talk to more people in intercollegiate athletics, I realized this something about it interested me. It was a gut feeling. And so I always encourage people who I talk to who want to get into this field to conduct informational interviews and to learn what's out there. There are so many different jobs out there. And some of them, someone might hear what I do and say, gosh, that's regulatory. You're not with the, I, I don't interact with student athletes on a daily basis. I get to see them periodically, but for someone who wants to be with the student athletes all the time, maybe that this isn't the right job for them. Or for someone that is really um, persuaded by the glitz and the glamour of the professional sports, you know, that's not what they're going to find in intercollegiate athletics for the most part. So I always encourage people to talk to different um, professionals that are in the field to find out about the different jobs and to listen to their own inner voice that tells them this sounds really cool this is what I want to do because when you find your passion that shows and people interviewing you are going to see that and then you have to go out and get the experience and you have to start at the bottom I started out with uh, internships while in school that's the best time to do it because you can afford to just work for free. Uh, and But even internships post-school. And you have to be willing to start at the bottom, willing to learn, willing to put in your dues. And then I always tell people to soak up all the information you can. So when I worked with the Committee on Infractions, that was a great opportunity, and I loved learning about the infractions cases, more about the rules, but that could have been a narrow position for me. I broadened it by making sure as I came into contact with Committee on Infractions members, the Commissioner of the Southeastern Conference was a member, the General Counsel at Brown, the Dean of George Washington Law School, the Dean of Oklahoma's Law School, faculty members were were members of the committee. I learned from them. I soaked up as much information and knowledge about intercollegiate athletics as I could. And that put me in a position to get to my next job. And then in that job, I just continued to learn. And I think that's the important piece, is to continue to learn, to continue to expand your horizons, and just follow your heart and your inner voice. And, and be in a place where the values match your own values. That's critical, too. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the football season, given the heat that we've had. It's hard to imagine that football is just around the corner, but it is just a little over a month away, and I can't wait to get out um, and watch the players on the field. I'm looking for a very competitive, exciting season. I hope the title comes down to the wire, and I, I read some articles where we're poised to have a season with the year of the quarterbacks, where we have uh, excellent quarterbacks on um all of our teams, and uh, I wish the players good luck, the coaches good luck. I hope the fans have a good time, uh, and I uh, am really looking forward to the season. So thanks for listening, and thanks for caring about Ivy League football.